All right, so when you get to the, uh, the sort of, let's say, the early or middle part of the 19th century, slavery across the British Empire is in the process of being abolished. It goes through various different phases. Uh, you then get labor substitution with the beginning of the indenture system, people coming from India and uh, other parts of the world to places like uh, Fiji or uh, coming to Trinidad or, or you know, the, the shift of labor in the wake of the abolition of slavery. How, how then does India become part of that story? Who, who works the cotton plantations once slavery has been abolished? Right, so slavery is abolished in the United States in 1865 in the wake of the American Civil War, which lasted from 1865 to, 1861 to 1865. And, and with the end of slavery in, in the United States, suddenly there's great concern among cotton manufacturers all over Europe. Where is all that cotton going to come from if we can't force enslaved workers to grow it? Um, and they're looking around the world to find places where they can secure that raw cotton, and they increasingly now, or they again focus on South Asia, and especially on India. At this point, they are able to secure much larger supplies of raw cotton from the, from the uh, South Asian uh, subcontinent, because uh, the, the colonial power at, in the 1860s and 1870s has been pushed much more into the Indian hinterland, thanks to... Um, uh, thanks to the railroads, thanks to the telegraphs, thanks to the administrative and bureaucratic structures of, of the colonial administration. Uh, and, uh, and, and they're able now to, the, like European cotton merchants are now able to connect to the growers of cotton in the Indian hinterland itself. So it's, n it's not plantation agriculture like in the United States. It's really small scale uh, uh, farmers, peasants who grow cotton which is then being purchased by, by, by Indian cotton merchants and then again purchased by, uh, by European cotton merchants, uh, but without the resort of, to, to slave labor. So, so, so what is crucial here is that the, that, that the, that, that the ability of, of, uh, of, of European capital, of, of, of colonial states to insert themselves into the social relations in the Indian countryside, but then also in other parts of the world, such as in Egypt, uh, uh, and then also in the southern parts of the United States has now reached such a degree that, that, that cotton can be secured without resorting to enslaving the cotton workers. Okay, so then there are, uh, there are people like that by Naraji or Gandhi who uh, talk about the idea of the drain theory, which then became very influential in the later 19th century. Does the drain theory uh, make sense within economic history as an idea? And do you want to just explain uh, what it is also? Right, so, so the idea is that the, basically the wealth of South Asia and, and other parts colonized by, by Europeans was, was drained in order to uh, help uh, uh, Europe uh, 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 develop economically. And, 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 and yes, I think there is a lot to that idea. It is, uh, it, it, it is, uh, it is, it is, it, I think it's hard to imagine the kind of peculiar economic development of the European continent without at the same time keeping in view what Europeans did in other parts of the world and how they did drain not just the wealth but also, for example, the knowledge.